us to describe sort of what this this new approach is that that everyone's so excited about in terms of genome wide association and I hope I'm being picked up now and Larry had asked me to make the point that there's a revolution going on so I went for the most revolutionary picture I could find which is is Willard's spirit of 76 and and actually it it is well worth making that point that really something dramatic has changed here and Larry has talked about it a bit and Emily and Francis in that we're much more able to scan the genome and look for differences between people than we have ever been before so technologic advances now allow us to measure hundreds of thousands now millions of variable points across the genome at a relatively low cost certainly not the 50 billion that that Francis had mentioned earlier probably about five hundred dollars per person depending on the platform that you use and using relatively little DNA so it used to be we needed you know close to a microgram of DNA in order and you only get maybe 20 or 100 micrograms out of a blood sample in order to measure really even just one genotype and then that went down quite a bit but was still so much that you couldn't really measure this many variants in one person without a whole lot of blood or DNA and now we can do all of these measurements in in a microgram or even considerably less than that what this also means is that these technologies can be applied to unrelated individuals and you heard earlier that there have been many studies funded by NIH and many other groups around the around the country and the world and basically have identified lots and lots of people and have studied them for the development of a whole bunch of different diseases schizophrenia or autism or psoriasis or whatever and those folks many of them have DNA stored in in freezers around the country and the world just waiting for these kinds of technologies to be available and now they can be applied we can also identify a multitude of subtle genetic effects that increase the risk of complex diseases and Neil Rish who many of you may have have heard speak whoops oh that's the advance what's no that's not even advanced there we go okay Neil likes to say that that genetically complex diseases which we describe as as diseases that are due to multiple genes are only complex because we looked for single genes and didn't find them so they must be complex and and remember that when we talk about Mendelian diseases we're really talking about a single gene and those are the sort of the lampposts that we had been studying for for so many years so what is a genome-wide association study? It's a method for interrogating all of the 10 million or so variable points across the genome. We've heard already that this variation is inherited in groups, luckily for us. So we don't have to measure all 10 million points. We can just measure a small subset of them. These blocks are longer in people who are more closely related. They're very long in identical twins. In fact, they're the entire genome. But in siblings or parents and offspring, they're about maybe 10 million base pairs long or perhaps a little bit longer than that. And the less closely you're related, the shorter those blocks are. So when you have people who are not related at all, except for 100,000 years ago when we all came out of Africa, you do need to test more and more of these SNPs. But you don't have to test them all. And so we now are able to do studies in unrelated people, assuming about a 10,000 base pair length that's shared. And that does vary by population. So in older populations, like populations in Africa, that length is much shorter. In younger populations, American Indians, other such populations, those lengths are much longer. One of the challenges in studying populations of recent African ancestry is that you do need to test more spots. And until we realize this, a lot of times we would look and really not see an association in Africans, and yet we would see it in non-Africans, and we'd say, oh, must be something funny here. Let's just focus on the non-Africans. And I think Vince will talk a little bit later about how that's been a challenge to deal with, but one that we can deal with. So just to kind of go back over again this concept of linkage disequilibrium, this is a paper from the New England Journal just very recently talking about what SNPs and genome-wide association may mean for medicine. And it shows here a chromosome and pulling out a gene. And here are various SNPs. These little red things are the exons. And you see SNP 1, 2, 3, and 4, just, again, a hypothetical gene. What's shown down here, you may see these kinds of triangles. This is very much like, you remember the AAA would give you these maps. And they'd say, you know, how far is it from New York to Chicago or from New York to San Francisco or New York to Tokyo? And that's based, whoops, 
I keep doing that. That's basically what this is. So this is the correlation between SNP1 here and SNP2. And when this block is very dark, it means that, boy, if you know SNP1, you can be pretty sure, like, Larry's gray sock, that other sock is probably gray. And SNP1 and SNP3 are pretty closely correlated, as are SNP1 and SNP4. But when you get down here to SNP1 and SNP5, they're not well correlated at all. So probably what happened between SNPs probably 4 and 5 was that there was a recombination event that DNA crossed over, and there was some advantage, or there was not. It was just a random event. But at any rate, those two are not well correlated. So say we just look at these SNPs 3, 4, and 5 in this very nice diagram that they did here, showing here SNP3 and SNP4. This could be a G or a T in SNP3, a C or a T in SNP4. But notice that every place where you have a G, where this person has a G, they have a C, every place. Every place where person 2 has a G, there's a C. Or where there's a T, there's a T. So these two are very closely correlated. If you know one, you know the other. As opposed to here, SNP4, you know, here sometimes you have a C and you've got a T. Sometimes you have a C and you have an A. Sometimes you have a T here and there's an A, sometimes a T and a T. So those SNPs are not well correlated. And this is the concept of tag SNPs. So this one can act as a proxy for that. It can't act as a proxy for that, so you need a different one. So that's all that we're talking about here. So mapping those was what the HAP map did, was to really define which ones are closely related to which others. And while that was going on, and partly as a stimulus, stimulated by the HAP map project, genotyping technology became much, much more efficient and less costly. This is a slide from my colleague Stephen Chanik showing that way back in 2001, we were probably spending about 100 cents per genotype, maybe a little bit less than that, for the standard genotyping technology of that day. And over time to 2005, those costs, and these are the different platforms, have gone down. And the number of SNPs that one can measure has gone up fairly dramatically. So here at the end of 2005, we were measuring between 100,000 and 500,000 SNPs at the cost of about a penny a genotype or even less. Those costs have continued to decline. This is only through October 2006 from my colleague Stacey Gabriel, and I should probably update it further. And that shows now we're showing these not by cost per SNP, but cost per person. So for a person's entire genome, both sets of their DNA, initially starting at about maybe $1,600 per person for the Affymetrics platform in July of 2005, that has declined dramatically. And other products have come on the market that have more and more SNPs, and Affymetrics now has one that's a million SNPs, as does Illumina. These probably have dropped down to about $200 or $300 per, you know, per person genotyped, and the 1 million SNP ones will come down in cost as well. So this has been really quite a dramatic change, and it has enabled us to afford these kinds of studies. Larry talked a bit about the chips, and you see them around there. This is the data that you get off of these. So when a genotyping lab does this, basically their computer produces a picture like this, which for SNP RS2990510 shows you the three different genotypes. So here you have someone who's a homozygous for one allele. I don't know which. Here's the heterozygote, and here's the homozygote. And likewise here, you can probably ignore these for the moment. Anyway, these are the numbers of people, and shown up here is basically the intensity of the light that's reflected back and read by the computer. And then there's a clustering algorithm, and these algorithms are very important and very complicated, and they also change fairly rapidly, that tries to basically read three different intensities, assuming that you have a SNP that is polymorphic. So you have two different copies. You have the A and the T. You could have picked up a sample that just by chance only had Ts. That SNP would be called monomorphic in that population. And in that case, you should see everybody clustering at one end. Now, sometimes the computer algorithms get confused when they see that, and they try to make it into two or three or whatever. And so it's important when you have a SNP that you're very interested in, you really want to take a look at these plots. You can't look at all 300,000 or 1 million, but you can look at the two or three or five or ten that you're quite interested in. As you can see here, these are called, these purple ones are called as heterozygous, but then there are a couple of folks that are kind of hanging out here that the algorithm doesn't quite know what to do with. And so there are errors or challenges in the technology in being able to read these. These would be called not called or missing SNPs. There are different rates of missing SNPs in different platforms, plus different genotype, DNA quality will give you different rates. And all of these things are things that are recommended to be reported in the report of a genome-wide association study. Unfortunately, these days, 
because the reports are so short that you end up having to look at that in the supplementary material. But most labs that are doing these now, you know, will report out their quality control, and it's very, very good. It's like 99.7 percent, you know, fidelity for these measures. So if you wanted to look at a data set from a genome-wide association study, you could actually look at the Coriell website. The National Institute of Neurologic Diseases and Stroke has done a Parkinson's, a study of Parkinson's disease, 297 cases, 297 controls. And you can go onto their website, agree to keep the data confidential per person and not to try to identify anyone and to use them only for scientific purposes. And then basically you'd have a chance to look at these data. So if you pulled up chromosome 22, which I picked because I'm a wimp and it's the smallest chromosome there is, and it's still a huge data set, the first two SNPs in that and the first three cases in that data set shown here, and here are the alleles. So allele 1 at this SNP for person 14 is a T. Allele 2 is also a T, so they're homozygote. Person 20 is a heterozygote. And then for the controls, the first three controls are shown here. And for allele, sorry, for this SNP, this allele, and notice that this one is the frequency of the A allele is much less. It's about 8 percent, actually. And when you get these results back, they actually give you a file that says, okay, in your sample we had 8 percent A's at this point, we had 50 percent T's at this point, whatever. So what you can then do is do what Emily and Francis were showing you, is basically count up all the cases you have and the controls that you have and see how many of them have A's and how many of them have G's. And if you were to do this, and these are totally made-up data, do not report this, but suppose you took a look at this one SNP, which was the second one that I showed you here. So allele 2, the one that only about 8 percent of people have an A at that spot. Say you took a whole bunch of people, 1,000 people that you collected from greater, you know, Richmond, Virginia, and you genotyped them, and you'd find that maybe about 8 percent of them have an A, the variant allele, at this particular point. So 920 of them don't have the A, they have the G variant there. And then you follow them forward in time, and you say, how many of these people actually develop Parkinson's disease? And you find that, gee, of the 80, 10 of them develop Parkinson's disease. And of the 920, only 40 developed Parkinson's disease. You could then estimate a risk, a relative risk, it's called, and this was sort of the standard measure of disease risk for many, many years until we got other computer programs that started calculating other things, which we'll talk about. But basically, you could look at the risk in the exposed, which is 10 out of 80, or 12.5 percent, compared to the risk in the unexposed, 40 out of 920, or 4.3 percent. And you would get a relative risk of 2.9. So somebody carrying this A allele is 2.9 times more likely to develop disease than somebody not carrying that allele. And that's a measure of risk. Usually we see estimates of things like smoking or family history in the three- to four-fold range for common diseases. The measures that we get for genes for common diseases are much less than that. So they're much less than one-and-a-half, usually, in the 1.2, 1.3 range, typically. Well, there's a measure called the odds ratio, which you're much more likely to see in genome-wide association studies, and there are two reasons for that. One is that you have to have a certain study design in order to be able to calculate a relative risk because you have to know what the denominator of your population is. So you had to know that there were 80 people total of whom 10 had the disease and the allele, and 920 total of whom a certain proportion had the allele and the disease. Sometimes you don't know that. In a case control study, you won't, and we'll talk about that in a second. In addition, there are many modeling systems that basically focus on the odds ratio because it's computationally simpler. And so just to talk about odds, and everybody really intuitively, I think, knows what odds are. Odds are related to probability. They're actually the probability of an event over the probability of it not happening. So the probability of it happening over 1 minus the probability of it happening, which is the probability of it not happening. So if the probability of a horse winning a race is 50 percent, we all know the odds are 1 to 1. If the probability is 25 percent, the odds are 1 to 3 for a win or 3 to 1 against a win. So those are odds. And again, if the probability of a person who's exposed to a given risk factor, if their probability of getting a disease is 25 percent, their odds are 25 percent over 75 percent, 1 to 3. Pretty simple. 
when we don't have denominators for risk estimates, which is typical in a case control study, we calculate an odds ratio. You may have heard about this if any of you took sort of, you know, basic statistics long ago um, as a cross product ratio, AD over BC, and I'll show you a two by two table where we get these names of these cells. And again, it's computationally easier. And if the disease is rare, the odds ratio approximates the relative risk. It always tends to overestimate it a little bit. So your relative risk might be 2.1 in that example that I showed you earlier. If you calculate it in an odds ratio, which we would do uh, by just multiplying. We call these cells A, B, C, D, very um, novel. Uh, but anyway, uh, if we just multiply these two A, D times B, C, we would get an odds ratio of about 3.1. So not that far, far off. Um, so here I actually um, uh, took the data that, that Francis is, is going to show you from the Helga Daughter paper, which is under, under embargo. Uh, and I won't give you the name of the SNP, but, but many of you probably have already seen it anyway. Um, and basically took the data that they had in their, in their tables, which you had to back calculate a bit. But, uh, but at any rate, uh, figuring out how many, they had uh, basically a group of cases, uh, 1,507 people who had myocardial infarction, 6,700 who did not have myocardial infarction. But we really don't know what the denominators of these are. Are these are, are sort of cases that they identified through a whole series of different studies. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, this is not in the book. We were trying to update things and, and be as, as up to date as we possibly could be. So my apologies, it's not in the book. Um, what I had given you was a, was a totally made up example from the Parkinson's data, and I thought a real example might be more fun. So anyway, um, so, so basically if you look at the, the frequencies of their alleles in their cases and controls, you can calculate these numbers, and then you can look at the odds and the exposed. So the odds of disease in the people with the variant allele would be 813 over 3061, right? That's probability P over one minus P. And, and the odds in people who did not have that allele would be 794 over 3667. If you wanted to do this cross product, it would be here, 813 times 3667 over 794 times 3061 equals 1.23. And in the paper, they quote 1.22. So, um, so hopefully I, I did my math right, and, and maybe we just have a little bit of a rounding error. Uh, and again, just remember that's embargoed until um, Thursday, I think. So the thing that's, that's important, that's you know, really conceptually very, very different for somebody like me and, and Larry was describing that we used to do these one at a time. Um, at the very end of, of my talk, I have some slides that they made me take out because they said they were boring. Um, but what they show is, is basically genotypes for one person in chromosome 22. Uh, it, this, there's a, it's a slide of them, and uh, several slides of them. It's basically about one page of word perfect single, I'm sorry, word single print, uh, single line, single space type. Um, for chromosome 22 for one person, what you get from the, the NINDS website is about seven pages, and that's only chromosome 22. Um, so there are lots of other chromosomes that are much bigger, and, and trying to, to manage these data is just mind-boggling. So basically, new approaches are needed for accessing, manipulating, and visualizing these data, and there have been some very creative approaches to doing this. But it does require an entirely new perspective. So we're no longer um, looking under the, under the lamppost, essentially saying, gee, I know there's a gene related to angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, um, which I know is somehow related to hypertension, so I'm going to relate my ACE gene polymorphisms to hypertension, and in some studies it was associated, and in some studies it was not. Um, in, in this kind of a paradigm, we're basically saying, we don't know much at all about the genome. We're going to interrogate across the entire thing and see what sort of comes up as being associated. Um, and we do have to recognize that when you do two or five or ten um, uh, kinds of study, uh, uh, kinds of tests like this, or hundreds of thousands of them, it is possible that the differences we observe just happen by chance. Differences do happen by chance. That's why people gamble. Um, and what you want is to try to, to sort of filter out the ones that might be due to chance versus the ones that are likely to be real. So I'm sorry, I know it's before lunch and we haven't had a break, but I do have to give you a little bit of statistical epidemiologic kinds of stuff. Um, so you probably all have heard of p-values. P-value is the probability of finding a result as extreme or more extreme than you observed in your study by chance alone. We used to focus on p-values of, of about um, uh, p less than 10 to the minus fourth, 0 .0001. Uh, when I was in epidemiology school, I was told, don't bother to look any, for p-values any smaller than that. They don't mean anything. And then they, no, surely this is what they used to teach us. Um, and then the geneticists came along and said, hey, we can test 100,000 or 500,000 things. We actually want to know if our p-value is 10 to the minus 10th or the minus 20th or the minus 30th, because we want to correct for the number of times we've looked. Um, and when you're looking for you know, a million times or so, you do want to have a, a much smaller p-value. 
Uh, you may have heard of type 1 error or alpha error. This is the probability of finding a difference when really in the truth of the universe there isn't one. Um, and it's also called sort of a spurious association. This is, has been the bane of, of what we called candidate gene association studies because, uh, you know, you test the ACE gene and the uh, angiotensinogen gene and lots of different genes for relationship with hypertension. And if you did them in small samples and you just happened to get lucky or unlucky, you might find an association. Very few of those associations were subsequent subsequently replicated. A type 2 error is the probability here. So here you find a difference where there isn't one. Here you don't find a difference when really there is one. Uh, this is one that, w that we tend to worry about a bit more uh, because we're concerned that we've, we have done a study that isn't, basically isn't big enough in order to be able to detect a difference. The difference was smaller than we, have, we expected it to be. We didn't look hard enough, whatever. Um, uh, we might have missed it. Power of a study is closely related to type 2 error. Basically, you know, there are two things that could happen. There, if, there, if there really is a difference, you can either find it or you can't find it. Uh, sorry, you can either find it with power uh, or you don't find it. So if you don't find it, you've committed type 2 error. If you do find it, it's just 1 minus the type 2 error. So that's the power of your study. We usually like to have studies that are powered for about 80% uh, about power, so you have an 80% chance of picking up a difference if it's really there. Most people actually prefer 90% or even a little bit more than that to pick it up. And then the effect size is the magnitude of risk associated with the variant. So those are those measures that I, I mentioned, the relative risk, 2.9, odds ratio, 1.23. There's also coming something called a hazard ratio that you'll see in some of these papers, which is the risk of a disease occurring over a, a given time period. And it takes into account the amount of time it, it takes for a disease to develop. And just be aware that um, you need very large sample sizes for these if you're looking for very small uh, p-values, which we are tending to do because we make so many comparisons. If the effect size is smaller, so if you're looking for a 1.2-fold relative risk or a 20% increase in risk, you need many, many more people to detect that than for a three-fold increase in risk or a five-fold increase in risk. Now, you might ask yourself, well, do I really care if the risk increased risk is only 1.2? And it used to be, again, that we would sort of say, mm, you know, that's probably not all that not all that important, but we are finding that there are genes that actually are quite important um, pathophysiologically and, and sort of as hints to treatment uh, that have risks about this size. So we probably do want to detect those. Um, allele frequency, if you have an allele that's only present in 8% of the population, you're going to need a lot more people to be able to find the association with the gene and the disease or the trait than if it's present in 40 or 50%. Um, and the measure that you're, that you're measuring, if it's very variable, if, it's, if you have a lot of error in your measurement, uh, it's going to be difficult, more difficult to separate out your groups with, you know, one gene, uh, with one variant versus another if that variant is having an effect on that measure. So the more variable that a measure is, blood pressure is a very variable measure. It changes um, uh, minute to minute, essentially. Uh, and so, so that's another challenge in, in uh, needing a large sample size. And you'll see displays like this. This is probably the first and best known um, uh, truly genome-wide association study published by Klein et al., looking at age-related macular degeneration. And what they did was point was plot with these little lines here, every spot along the genome that they had tested, 100,000 of them. This is log to the, my, sorry, minus log 10 of P. So remember, your logs were those exponents. So if you're, if you're looking at a, a P value of 10 to the minus fourth, the minus log 10 of that would be four. Uh, and so here is your four level, here is your six level, and just above six, 10 to the minus seventh, um, is where this one, this one that turned out to be uh, very, very suspicious for being causative uh, complement factor H um, was, was hiding. So that's one way of looking at them. Uh, this is another way, much more colorful, uh, from the, the Broad and MIT folks looking at their diabetes scan. Uh, and basically what they did was to color code by chromosomes. And as you can see, this chromosome is very big. This gap here is, is the, teal, sorry, the centromere where you can't measure it. And then they get smaller and smaller, and here's my chromosome 22 way down there. Uh, but anyway, looking at, at the, the SNPs that, that are associated and just plotting the minus log um, of the, of the p-value. Uh, so here's one that's really, really associated uh, very strongly, at least highly unlikely likely to be due to chance could be due to things like genotyping error, or it could be due to things like um, you, you, you picked a sort of a funky population in that, so you need to be able to replicate them. But at least it's not due to chance. Okay. Um, this same group published a, a recently uh, a, a genome-wide scan for prostate cancer. What you'll sometimes see is that instead of showing you the entire genome, although often they'll do this, um, they'll say, you know, this area looks very interesting. We think it's interesting because there's a clump of them and because we know that this particular chromosome, which Francis will talk about, is related to um, uh, disease, whatever it might be. And, and that was done here for prostate cancer. This is the 8Q24 region, which everyone has sort of, is sort of scratching their heads. Why is it? Um, 
that this is related to prostate cancer when there don't seem to be any genes there. And it's probably because we know so little about the genome that we'll learn a great deal about it from this kind of example. What they did was to look at this particular area. Here is the SNP that they found most strongly associated with it. And then basically, statistically, they adjusted for the presence of this SNP. So you're using a model. You're calculating out an odds ratio for each one of these things. Here's the p-value for that odds ratio. And once you basically hold this constant statistically, go this way. Once you hold this constant, then all of the rest of these kind of fall down to the bottom. So their association is much less strong. And that's because they're correlated with this one. And here, this one is sort of the next most strongly correlated. And once you adjust for that, then all of the rest of these kind of fall down below the threshold. And they did this about five times. It's really a very nice progression in the paper, Hayman et al., in Nature Genetics. And this is one that you'll see from Francis in a little bit. Sorry to have stolen it from you. We're looking at chromosome 11. Again, here's a SNP that was of great interest. Here are a bunch of SNPs that are associated with it. Once you adjust for that, all of the rest of these fall out. And here's one of those triangle AAA diagrams that we showed you previously that shows why. That basically, there's a strong block of linkage disequilibrium. All of these things are correlated with each other. And that's basically what you're picking up with this one SNP. Okay. I mentioned about how genome-wide association studies, sorry, about how candidate gene associations have had some challenges in replicating their findings. As you see here, 600 associations, only six of them were significant in more than three studies. This is a nice paper by Joel Hirshhorn. And this is not to say that candidate gene studies are bad. What it is to say is that it's very easy for us to find spurious associations when we only look once or twice. And what this taught us was that when we start doing things like genome-wide association, we have to replicate multiple multiple times. And as we've seen, replication really now is considered to be the sine qua non. So you'll see these papers coming through where they've done three or four or five studies at a time showing, yes, it does replicate in all of these populations. So large sample sizes, multiple studies are needed to replicate the findings. These produce massive data sets. The analysis requires a huge and a very specialized effort. And better analytic methods are needed. And we recognize that if we make these data widely available, that will stimulate the analysis of these methods. In addition, once you measure somebody's genome, you can relate it to anything. So you've already got it measured. You can look at their height. You can look at their weight. You can look at lots and lots of different things. So these data sets are very rich. And one of the things that we are focusing on a great deal at NIH is making sure that the data sets are made available to lots of different investigators so that you don't have sort of the syndrome of this first fly on a beached whale who lands on it and says, dibs, this is all mine. And we certainly don't want that happening with genome-wide studies. And there has been a tendency for that to happen. So we are pushing very hard to make these data widely available. So the revolution is probably here. Extensive characterization is now possible. It can be applied to unrelated individuals to find genetic, putative genetic causes of diseases. Many existing studies are out there basically waiting for this technology to be applied to them. But we do need new approaches to manipulating the data. And we need responsible approaches to sharing data so that participants are protected. And the investigators who produce the data sets also get some recognition for their efforts. And we believe strongly the collaboration for both replication of findings and investigation of function is absolutely crucial. So I think at that point I'll stop and be happy to take questions. Yes, Jim. I'm just curious. Since the p-values are so important in terms of giving some sort of a credibility, and you know that you're getting multiple comparisons, so you have to have smaller p-values, isn't there some statistic that accommodates the fact that you are doing, I mean, how does that work? Sure. Well, there are a couple of different ways. People debate, you know, what's the best way to correct for that. I mean, you could say that basically a p-value, it's very interesting, you know, how we ever got to, back in the olden days, the p-value was .05. And if you had a chance of less than 1 in 20 of picking up a difference totally by chance, people were sort of comfortable with that. Well, where did that come from? Well, the way it was explained to me is that if you flip a coin, when you think about flipping a coin, you get heads. And you say, well, you know, I could have gotten heads, you know, it's about 50 percent. And you flip it again and you get heads. And you say, well, you know, 25 percent chance of that. And you flip it again, you get heads. And you kind of say, no, it's a little bit odd. But you do it a fourth time and you get heads. Now you want to look at the coin. Okay? So that's something that's unusual. And that's 6.25. So maybe that's how we got to a 5 percent being a level that people were uncomfortable with. But, you know, but it really is totally arbitrary. And when we look more than one time, we may say, well, you know, if I actually checked 
5 percent, you know, I take these 5 percent of differences as being statistically significant or unlikely to have happened by chance. Well, if I do 20 differences, you know, out of 20, roughly, on average, one of them is going to be, you know, appear to be different even though it really isn't. So maybe I need to do, I need to correct for that for the number of times that I've looked. And one way that people do that is to divide the p-value by the number of times that you've looked. That's called a Bonferroni correction. It's thought to be very conservative because it assumes that every test you're doing is independent. And these tests are not independent because they're all stuck on, you know, many of them are stuck on the same chromosomes. So there are other ways of doing this. You can permute the genotypes, basically. So you say, I'm going to randomly generate genotypes and see how often, just by where I know that it's random, how often I see an association with my trait. And that's another way of correcting. There are a couple of others. Thank you. Please page back to the macular generation. You just went past it. So see that p-value of 4.8 times 10 to the minus 7. Where does that come from? Well, that comes from the fact that in this study, they tested about 100,000 SNPs. And they were assuming sort of this conservative correction. So they said they wanted to achieve effectively a p-value of 0.05, but they're doing 100,000 independent tests. So they've got to divide 0.05 by 100,000. And that gives you that dashed line. So they were arguing that any result that fell above that, that is that the p-value was even better, was likely to be significant and not noise. And anything that fell below that dotted line might be significant, but you haven't proved it. Yes. Yeah, you said that a p-value like that wouldn't, can't happen by chance alone, but. It would be very likely, but if you did, you know, a million of these such tests, you might come across one like that. Okay, but actually, but you said, but it could be a genotyping error. And what, I guess I don't know, what is a genotyping error? As I showed you before with these calling algorithms, sometimes they get confused. And particularly if you genotype your cases and your controls differently, sorry, in sort of different batches. So when you're doing this test, say that for some reason your controls, the DNA is different, it's come from a different, so it's buccal source instead of blood source. You know, for whatever reason, when you do this test, instead of getting these nicely separated, they're actually more of a smear together. So just from that kind of an error, you could sort of generate a difference between them where really there is no difference. That's a technological error. I'm not explaining it well, and I'm sorry, I'm caffeine deprived. But also you could get errors. It is possible or conceivable, and maybe Larry, you'd want to comment on this as well, that there might be other genes or other variants in the region that would interfere with this that might be related to cases and not in controls or something. What other kinds of genotyping errors can give you spurious associations? I think those are the main ones. I mean, some things don't behave well in the assay in cases and controls and get tossed out. They never get into the final data set. The other issue is the population stratification one that you might want to discuss, because that's another place where you can produce false positive results. And population stratification is another really horrible name for differences in the sort of ancestry between cases and controls. So say you selected all your cases, you know, not that anyone would do this, but it does happen sometimes in not very good studies. Say you selected all of your cases from people from Finland and all of your controls from people from Japan. They're going to have different allele frequencies just because of the population history. And so any differences between them, if there are differences in disease as well, you're going to start ascribing those to the disease where they might not be related at all. This actually has been used as a way of finding genes that might be related to disease. It's called admixture mapping and has been a technique that's been used in the past. It's not used very often anymore. But that's another thing that could cause differences. If there are systematic differences between your cases and controls, those are, you know, old-time epidemiologists call those confounders. And it's just a confounder between by now genotype instead of environmental exposure factor. Does that help? Could you go back to the science embargoed slide and talk slowly about the probability issue again and how you got to where you did? I can go back. Whether I can talk slowly is something else. 
tried and tried, and it's just never quite gotten to it. But at any rate, what we have here, what they basically published in the paper or in the table, and you may have it there, is the number of cases, the number of controls, and the allele frequencies. So for this particular step, they gave the number of cases was 1507, the number of controls was 6728. And then they said that 0.453 of the cases had the allele A, and 0. whatever that was of the controls had allele A. Sorry, of the controls were the controls. Yes, of the controls had allele A. So basically what I did was just take those proportions and multiply them by 1507 and figured out how many people were both cases and had allele A, how many people were controls and had allele A, subtracted that from this total number to get this number, and this from that total number to get that number, and then did the cross product. Sorry. It was allele A and the other example, and I'm perseverating. You're right, it's allele B. Does that help? I think so. Okay. Yeah, it's just a matter of filling out your two-by-two table, essentially. I think I'm still not understanding why it is that genome-wide association studies are, as I think you're saying, less likely to find spurious associations than the earlier, you know, single candidate gene approach. Could you take another stab at that? Please don't leave this room thinking that genome-wide associations are less likely to find spurious. They are more likely to because you're doing many more tests. The reason now that we're less likely, hopefully, to find spurious associations is that we recognize that so many of them are possibly spurious, that we do replications of them. And we require, in the same study, either the same population, more likely a different population, a different, completely different study. And so you may see in one of the science papers, you know, there were several different groups around Canada and Texas and different places. Some of them used different phenotypes, which is a little bit risky. Some used MI and some used coronary calcification. And, you know, if the gene that you're looking at is related to both MI and coronary myocardiopathy and coronary calcification, then, you know, you're golden. And it actually gives you more reassurance that you're finding something that's likely to be important. Yes, sir. Another reason why Canada gene studies were particularly likely to give false positives is because there were so few true positives, right? So if you're assuming that the genes that are on your short list must contain some that are actually right, and you keep trying over and over again, sooner or later, by chance, you're going to get one that looks encouraging. There's a natural pressure, of course, to publish something that looks positive. You say, well, let's put it out there and see if anybody can validate it. In most of those instances, the validation didn't happen, so you ended up with a paper reporting the finding and then a paper refuting the finding. So we filled up the literature. One of the things that's different here is with a genome-wide association study, for most of the diseases we go after, if you have a sufficient number of samples, there are going to be true positives. And as long as you're rigorous about your statistics and making sure your cases and controls were well matched, you're going to have real results to be able to write about. And so when you see those publications coming out, it's likely, if they did everything right, that the top tier of what they have found will be validated. And I think that's certainly been true in the last month or so with these particular studies. So, again, if you're trying to do a study where you know you're doomed to failure, but there's still a pressure to publish, there's going to be stuff coming out. If you have a study where you're almost certainly going to find something, then if you do it right, you'll publish something that's right. I think a point that's important to make as well is in these replication studies, very often it's not the most strongly associated SNP in the first study that actually survives to be replicated. There are those who argue that the ones with the SNPs that are really, really extreme are the ones you should be nervous about. There are others who say, oh, no, I like the ones that are really, really strongly associated. Regardless, when you do the replication study, very often it's kind of the middle ones that replicate. So you take a large number of them and replicate them in a second sample, and then a smaller number of those that are associated in both studies and replicate them in a third and maybe even a fourth and a fifth before you say, well, you know, this looks pretty good. I think I'll buy it. And then still, you put it out in the literature, and, you know, 20 groups try to replicate it, and hopefully most of them do. Thank you. 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 Thank you